It's four miles long. This challenging course seems to be built for the Spaniard. Following this initial climb and descent, there's 10 miles of flat before a five mile haul to the Melette finish. Also emerging as a contender is another Spanish veteran, Marino Lajareta, who is destined to take second place today. Fastest of all is Stephen Rooks, the 1989 runner-up, who is slowly climbing his way back into contention. He records the best time yet. It's one hour, ten minutes and forty-two seconds. Another contender is Charlie Motte, trying perhaps too hard and is heading for only fourteenth place. In contrast, Kelly is having a super day and will come in sixth, only 17 seconds behind Delgado. But of course, the main focus is on Greg Lamond, who is still only seven seconds behind Laurent Fignon on overall time. The French race leader is well aware of his vulnerability as well. Le Mans starts impressively. He has again fitted the aero handlebars, planning to use them on the flat section between the course's two climbs. The American knows he's within a few seconds of Delgado's time, and he sprints in with a time just eight seconds slower than the Spaniard. Meanwhile, Fignon isn't looking comfortable at all on the climbs. His style is ungainly, and although he's faster than Motte, 10th place, 47 seconds slower than Lamond, is worse than Fignon feared. So, the yellow jersey is back on the American shoulders. Staying in the Alps, the first of four mountain stages set out from Gap. At the start, Greg Lamond strikes up a conversation with former teammate Andy Hampston. But there's no time for chatting in this speeding line of riders as they cross the Serre Ponson Reservoir. The breakaways begin and 18 riders gain six minutes before the first mountain pass, the Col de Var. Swiss champion Richard, in the blue is Bruno Cornier of France, and they split from the league group. They quickly gain time on the others as they tackle the seven miles of climbing. The pace in the main pack is steady on the approach to the VAR. Richard, the Swiss champion, and Cornier still maintain a six minutes lead. While behind, Greg Lamond has a flat tyre. He's given a wheel by his teammate, Eddie Plankett. Quickly, the yellow jersey moves back towards the peloton. As the leaders approach the 7,000 feet summit, it's Cornier who sets the pace. Behind there's a counter-attack being launched by Alcala. Le Monde on the right, Delgado, Ternisa, Lajaretta and Hampston are also here. The name missing, Laurent Fignon. The Frenchman is desperately leading a chase group and he's not receiving any help from Alcala's PDM teammates, Rooks and Kelly. 
Cornier is the best place to the two leaders, although his 18 minutes deficit makes him no threat to the race overall. He spins ahead and takes the mountain prize. Behind, Miller has managed to join the Alcala counter-attack. But where is the Fignon group? Here they come, led by Fignon, just about 30 seconds back. It's a serious situation for Fignon, but luckily for him, his teammate Thierry Marie has dropped back from the original breakaway group to help his leader close the gap on the descent. Meanwhile, the focus returns to the leaders. And after Fignon rejoins Le Monde, Richard and Cornier head through the feed zone at Guiest. They again stretch their lead to more than six minutes. The wind remains favourable in the gorge approaching the day's main obstacle, the mighty Col d'Isoire. Approaching the village of Avieux, six miles from the summit, the main pack has reformed. In front, on the steepest part of the twisting climb, Richard rides away from Cornier and he won't look round until the finish line in Briançon. It's still 16 miles away. The Col d'Isoire is a legend in tour history. Everybody would like to lead here. The huge crowds always flock to see the action on the Isoire which has seen some legendary battles in previous tours. It's the mountain where two past champions are remembered, Fausto Coppi and Lewis and Bobet. Cornet is steadily losing ground on Richard, but he's in no danger of being caught by the small chase group being led by Motte, Ternisse and in yellow, Greg Lamond. Delgado makes his expected attack still trying to make up his 2 minutes 48 seconds deficit on the race lead. But the yellow jersey is still in control of this particular situation. The action behind has meant that Richard's lead has been cut to only 5 minutes and his time now to bask in the glory of his energetic breakaway as he approaches the 7,700 foot summit. Fignon is again struggling and only Le Monde, Motte and Ternisse have caught up with Delgado. Just before the top, Charlie Motte sprints ahead. And he continues his effort to attack the long technical descent on his own while Fignon desperately tries to close his 10 seconds deficit on Greg Lamond. The Swiss champion is already down the steepest part of the descent, just the finish to come. And behind, Lamond links up with Charlie Motte in an opportunist attack to beat Fignon. They career around the corners at over 50 miles an hour, inching their way clear of Delgado and the rest. But the French ace, Laurent Fignon, simply won't give up. The finish in Briançon is up a viciously steep climb, 
which proves no problem for the runaway Richard. But for Laurent Fignon, well, he's still in desperate trouble in pursuit of the other leaders. Richard wins the stage with a lead of over two minutes on Bruno Cornier, who didn't get caught by the field. While the leaders take their battle to the finishing hill as well, Motte and Lamont have been recaught by Delgado, Turnisser, Rux and Marshal Gaillon of France. But Fignon still can't quite make contact. Fignon is just behind. A few valuable seconds being conceded. It's Charlie Motte who sprints away for third place on the stage ahead of Greg Lamont. And the seconds tick by until in fact 13 will have passed before Laurent Fignon comes across the line. And who is to know how valuable those few seconds might be? Greg Lamont was now 53 seconds in front of the Frenchman and once more a memorable battle had been produced at the Citadel of Briançon. On stage 17, the most demanding stage of the tour, crossing the 8,700-foot Col de Galibier and the 6,800-foot Croix de Fer. It's a notorious climb to the finish at Alpe d'Huez, and consequently, there was no hurry to begin with. The first climb on the menu, as always, the Col de Galibier. Close to the summit of the Col de Glibier stands a stone monument dedicated to Henri de Grange, the founder of the Tour de France in 1903. Delgado knows that this stage is his final chance to make up time on Le Monde and Fignon. So, to ensure that his rivals don't have an easy day, his teammates Garospe and Rodriguez Magro set a strong tempo. But Le Monde is looking secure in his yellow jersey. A sudden acceleration by the Frenchman Laurent Biondi is of secondary interest. Even when a chase is started by Turnisser and the Italian Franco Vona. Waiting anxiously at the roadside is Cathy Le Monde. She can barely believe that her husband is leading the Tour de France only a month after he'd spoken of quitting the sport. Up at the Glibier summit, the highest point of the 1989 Tour, Ternissa shows just why he's wearing the King of the Mountains polka dot leader's jersey. Turnisher is followed over the summit 15 seconds later by this group, which included Rooks and Robert Miller. Turnisher is first into the long twisting descent. But some riders can't control their speed, such as this French rider, Gilles Sanders. He's lucky that his crash isn't more serious. Turnisser has been rejoined by Vona and Biondi and continues the top speed plunge in their wake.
after descending for 10 miles, the leaders are joined by the Australian Phil Anderson, along with yesterday's winner, Richard, and six other riders. And just ahead of them all, Bona heads off on a solo spin. But Tönisse and company are just behind as they start the second part of the 30 miles descent. They catch the Italian in the valley and there are now 11 riders in the front, a minute ahead of the main pack. Into a strong headwind, the pack, led here by some of Le Mans' ADR teammates, are heading now towards the Croix de Fer climb. Hidden away in the centre of the pack is the yellow jersey of Greg LeMond. He's ridden these roads before when he won the 1986 tour, but he still checks out the details on his race map. The 11 leaders reach the feed zone at Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne, one minute 15 seconds ahead of the field. And with only one feed zone in this five-hour stage, it's particularly important not to miss your food bag. But race leader Greg Lamont does just that. No wonder he's angry. The Quad de Fer climb, 16 miles long, starts right after the feed zone, and Ternisa is soon forcing the pace. Only Richard, Colombian Alberto Camargo, and the Spaniard Anselmo Fuerte can stay with him. While Lamond and Delgado's team climbing at an even pace, only 20 or so can remain with them. Even Charlie Motte is dropped, while Green Jersey Kelly is delayed by a puncture. Because of the constant pressure, the breakaway group can never gain more than 90 seconds. Ternisa is relentless in his attack. And 10 miles from the summit, the Dutchman rides away from Richard and Fuerte. He's facing 43 miles before the finish line. And of course, Alp Duez. The Yellow Jersey group continues to be led by Delgado's Reynolds team. Now in glorious isolation, the Dutch King of the Mountains shows off his white and red leader's jersey to his newly won public. They call him the Wizard of Oss because he comes from the town of Oss in Holland. Others call him Hiawatha because of his flowing locks. The pace is still steady in the chase group behind, always under the policing of the Reynolds team. And Charlie Motte on the left here, who is in charge in the Pyrenees, is now receiving help from his teammate Caritou in the trickle of Jersey. 
while Kelly is still catching up from his puncture. summit of the quad affair turns to shows no signs of weakening. And he starts yet another long descent with a lead of 1 minute 27 seconds over the Le Mans group. Motte and Kelly manage to rejoin just before the top where Miller spins for the King of the Mountains points ahead of Fignon, Rooks, Le Mans, Alcala and Delgado. With his long limbs and hair, Turnis is not the most aerodynamically shaped cyclist, but his determined style sees him increase his lead on this rapid descent. After 17 miles of descent, often at speeds over 60 miles an hour, Ternisa is just over two minutes ahead of a group led by Robert Miller and three and a half minutes ahead of the Le Mans group. If the 26 years old Ternisa could maintain this lead to the finish, he would climb into the top five of the tour, but he had yet to survive the Alp. A sign at the bottom of the Alpe d'Huez mountain road signals the first of 21 switchback turns that will lift the racers through 3,700 vertical feet in just eight miles. Over half a million fans are waiting on the mountainside. And Turnisse is aware that roughly half of those fans are from his native Netherlands. The Dutch have a great reputation on this climb. Ternisse focuses on the climb, only 13 kilometers, eight miles to go. Four minutes back of Ternisse, Fignon throws down the challenge with a surprise early attack, and Le Monde is the first to react. Delgado, who'd expected to be dictating the tactics, is the next to take up the chase. He's quickly followed by Raul Alcala. Alcala and Delgado join forces and for the next five minutes they pursue the two race leaders. This now is a psychological battle as well as a physical one. With several minutes in hand, Turnis is able to climb at a much steadier rate. He's already been out front now for more than three hours and the cheers of the crowd give him the extra boost he needs. There has been a slight lull in the chase and Rooks and La Javetta are slowly catching back. They close in on Alcala at the back here and Delgado just in front, Le Monde and Fignon.
two great climbers come back into the race. Ternisa is now aware of the active chase behind him, knowing that Fignon's group is only three turns below. Le Mans decides to put in an attack, testing his rival's strength. But Fignon is still feeling strong. Besides the steep grade and the distance, Ternisa is also fighting a battle against the heat of a 90 degree day. Again, the pace has momentarily slowed in the group, and Delgado's Colombian teammate, Abelardo Rondon, links up. Rondon immediately increased the tempo with Delgado on his wheel. The others respond, but one by one, Alcala, Rux and La Jareta are shed from the group. And only four men remain together, Rondon, Delgado, Le Monde and Fignon. Only two men remain in front of these chasers, the leader Ternisa and Robert Miller, the only survivor of the very early counter-attack. The chasers pass under the four kilometers to go banner from the back. Fignon notices that Le Monde's head is rolling and immediately attacks. Fignon's move stuns his three companions. But just as they catch Robert Miller, it's Pedro Delgado who eventually takes up the pace. Le Monde and Rondon are unable to follow. Miller is one who has thrown everything into the attack and now he's paying for it. Le Monde has tried at least to keep Delgado in sight but he too is paying for it now as Rondon comes alongside him. Delgado is still chasing Fignon and whoever wins this tremendous duel may also win the Tour de France. Ternisa is still riding towards the summit with great strength. His advantage, almost two minutes ahead of Finnmark. While Le Monde is now alone, fighting a personal battle against fatigue, he knows that he could even lose the Tour de France itself if he doesn't dig deeper into his reserves. Just over a mile remaining, Delgado finally catches Laurent Fignon. But there's no let up in their speed. They hear that the Monde is already 52 seconds behind them. Le Monde has now passed the last of those 21 turns, and as he heads into Alpe d'Huez town, he's moving easier. At the other end of town, Ternisa makes the final turn and heads up towards the finish line. Just 300 yards to go. Ternisa's marvellous adventure has ended in success. The sixth Dutch cyclist to win a tour stage at Alpe d'Huez. Farther back, the battle for the yellow jersey is still being waged, with Fignon and Delgado 
racing as hard as they can to take the jersey from Le Mans. And here's Le Mans. He seems to be getting his second win. But can he save his yellow jersey? At the final turn, Fignon and Delgado are still locked together, a minute back of Ternisa. And Le Monde is going faster in his desperate pursuit. The sprint for second place goes to Pedro Delgado. And then the countdown begins for Greg Le Monde. His two most dangerous rivals are home. Seconds now mean exactly that. Greg Le Monde started the day 53 seconds ahead of Fignon and he's already a minute behind him as he puts everything into his final effort. He crosses the line in fifth place, one minute, 19 seconds behind Fignon. Another sensational stage has ended. And the result is that once again, Laurent Fignon is back in the lead of the Tour de France. This is the third time he's taken the yellow jersey in his career. The last two times he went on to win the Tour. And they were both achieved here at Alpe d'Huez. Today nothing much is expected from this short 18th stage, especially after the sensation of Alpe d'Huez. It's the Colombian National Day, and maybe the celebrating Colombian cyclists will find some success. And predictably, the stage spins into life when Colombian national hero Lucho Herrera attacks 20 miles from the finish. Once again, as a potential tour winner, Herrera has had a poor race. He's almost 30 minutes behind on overall time, but now, three minutes from the top of the San Nizier Hill, he's 42 seconds ahead of the pack. When the incredible Laurent Fignon launches another surprise attack, the yellow jersey is going away from the other leaders. He wants to increase his overall 26 seconds lead over Le Monde. Fignon is soon up to Herrera and races straight by the little Colombian. There is panic behind as Le Monde, Delgado and the rest are starting to chase. They can see the yellow jersey just in front. A sudden acceleration strings out the pack and the back markers will concede 10 minutes or more by the finish. Mon Delgado and Ternisa pull clear of Lucho Herrera. A battle to limit the escape of Laurent Fignon and the 15 seconds behind him as he nears the top of the climb with only 13 miles to go. It's not a big lead, but when Delgado eases back from the front, the other three also relax. For a while, no one will chase down Fignon. They could be allowing the tour to go through their fingers, and so Delgado reluctantly takes up the chase again. Alcala, Rooks, Kelly, and a few others have regrouped behind them.
They're now too far back, and the race is remaining a battle between the Le Mans trio. And they too have the hands full. The French hero is now 35 seconds ahead, and there's only seven miles to go. It looks as though Fignon is putting the yellow jersey totally out of reach. But Alcala's group is now closing fast. But when they catch the three chasers, Fignon's lead has leapt to 52 seconds. Only two miles remain, and it's all uphill to the finishing line. Fignon is fighting hard, but he's taken a lot out of himself. And now Rooks is really starting to move too, pulling the chasers closer and closer. Fignon has clinched the stage and is delighted with his performance. But how much time has he taken from Greg Lamont? All eyes turn to the final bend, and here comes Rooks and Turnisa with Lamont tucked in behind. Lamond will lose 24 seconds, and Delgado a few seconds more. Everyone says the tour is over, that Fignon's new lead of 50 seconds is too much for Lamont to make up in the final three stages. Stage 19 is the first of these, and it contains the last three climbs of the 1989 tour. And it all begins with a long downhill. But the easy part is soon over, and the tough Col de Port climb looms over Grenoble. The yellow jersey seems to have inspired Fignon, and he's again on the rampage. And by the midpoint of the severe 10 miles climb, only four riders are left in his wake. La Jareta, Delgado, Ternisa, and Greg Lamont. By the top, the five leaders have a lead of 90 seconds. It seems now that Fignon is unstoppable, and he launches another attack on the first slopes of the Col du Coucheron. He gains 150 yards. But the world's finest climbers just behind him hadn't given up hope yet. They persist in their chase, and they rejoin the yellow jersey. Calm is restored, and the top five men in the race continue to pull away from the rest. They're three minutes ahead when they crest this tour's final mountain, the Col de Grenier. Le Mans then tries to break clear on the sweeping descent, but Fignon is too alert for that one. The five are still together in the street of Chambéry when they nearly all fall down at badly positioned traffic islands. But there's no real damage done and together they head for the finish beside the lake at Aix-les-Bains. While Le Mans sits neatly in behind the yellow jersey, La Jareta leads out the sprint, but the Spaniard is quickly overhauled, and the delighted Greg Le Mans powers his way to the line for the stage win. It's a great morale booster for the American, who even suggests he might make up his 50 seconds deficit in Paris. But before the final time trial, there's this one final chance for the sprinters to find some glory. Like the rest of the 138 survivors, Fignon is happy that the end of the tour is near. And they're ready for some fun on this completely flat penultimate stage. Anderson makes a bid for victory five miles from the finish. 
putting everything into his one attack. But after a mile of freedom, he will be caught. The sprinters have waited for a week for this flat terrain, and the young Italian Giovanni Verdanza makes a last desperate thrust to take victory. It seems that Fignon's crown is safe for the final showdown in Paris, which is reached by a 300 miles ride on the TGV Express. Le Monde relaxes on the two-hour trip, while Delgado gives an interview. And on their arrival in Paris, Fignon gets upset when pursued by a TV news team. Perhaps Fignon is nervous about this final time trial, but it seems designed to give him a triumph into his hometown. But maybe history will repeat itself. It was 200 years ago, during the French Revolution, that King Louis XVI was removed from his home, the gigantic Palace of Versailles. The king was taken to Paris and was executed three years later. Is King Fignon also going to lose his crown? And the only man who can do it is Greg Lamond, and he certainly looks confident at the start in Versailles. If anything, Fignon seems overconfident. The ponytail Parisian can't even consider losing 50 seconds in 15 miles. For Delgado, the stage is a formality. He knows that he won't make two and a half minutes up on Fignon, but he's proud that he's proven himself. To come back from 198th place in Luxembourg to third in Paris has been a remarkable achievement. But Le Mans still has a 1 in 100 chance of winning this tour. He's riding his aerodynamic bike, wearing his aero helmet, and using his narrow aero handlebars, and he says he feels strong. The timekeeper counts down the seconds. And Le Monde is away on this ultimate trip. Two minutes after his American rival, Laurent Fignon enters the starting house. He too has his aero bike, but no aero helmet and no aero bars. The countdown begins. And now Fignon is underway for this 27 minute ride to destiny. Le Monde is a pure picture of power, approaching 40 miles an hour on this opening stretch. On reaching the River Seine at six miles, Fignon is 18 seconds behind Le Monde, a loss of three seconds per mile. At this rate, he'll lose the stage by 45 seconds but win the tour by five. Le Monde is relentless in his challenge, smoothly turning his biggest gear. Fignon, in contrast, is more erratic. He stands on his pedals in search of extra power, but he only breaks his rhythm. He's down 37 seconds, only 13 seconds left in hand, 4.7 miles to ride. Cathy Lamont can't believe that the impossible is coming true. But there's her husband, Greg. He's thumping down the Champs-Élysées, about to catch Delgado for two minutes. Greg Lamont's time trial is over, a time of 26 minutes 57 seconds, a record speed of 34 miles an hour. Kathy and her father-in-law gasp in astonishment. Greg Lamont celebrates in anticipation with his coach Otto Giacome. 
And there is Fignon. Can he still hang on to his crown? He's across the line. And the clock shows a time of 27 minutes 55. He's 58 seconds slower than the Monde. Fignon has lost the Tour de France by eight seconds. The smallest margin in the history of the Tour. There's only pain and sorrow for Laurent Fignon. And tears and joy for Greg Lamont. Delusion for France and delight for America. Fignon is shattered by his defeat, but he will live to fight another tour. Le Monde is rejuvenated by his win. He says, this was the hardest race of my career, but the happiest day of my life. On the victory podium, the American tells his French rival, now we've both won two tours. We'll see next year who can win the third.